very warm welcome to all our, all our attendees today. Um, we have a great panel discussion on the topic of collaboration within higher education in the Middle East. We have two great panelists to share the next 30 minutes with and I'll let them introduce themselves to you all. Uh, so without further ado, I'm conscious of our time restraints, we'll uh, jump in straight into the topic. And uh, I'll ask Hugh to introduce himself and also to talk about what does a thriving higher education collaboration space look like, please? Thank you, Ivor, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are listening to us from today. Um, my name is Hugh Martin. As Ivor said, I'm the Registrar and Chief Administrative Officer at the British University in Dubai, which is a, until recently a postgraduate-only research-intensive university in the UAE, producing some of the uh, largest numbers of PhDs in the region. Um, so. From my perspective, and I'm, I'm going to be candid um, because, uh, as Ivor and Tanya already know of me, um, I think we need to be in this space. And many of the con contributors to this summit have already been so today and yesterday, which is fantastic to hear. Striving collaboration um, is something many of us are used to in, say, the UK, the US, Australia and elsewhere. But it's not a given. And it requires us to drop some of our uh, suspicions of each other and some of our uh, feelings that we might have that we're in competition for students, for numbers, for funding. Because if we don't do that, this sector is very competitive, but we end up, all of us, reinventing the wheel. And those of us like me and Tenya and others who run universities administration have very difficult jobs to do with institutions, hundreds of millions of dollars coming in in some cases. Uh, it, it doesn't work in the education sphere to spend time reinventing the wheel and being suspicious of each, uh, suspicious of each other. Thank you, Hugh. And Tenia, over to you. Can you give me your views on, on what a thriving higher education collaboration system might look like? Thank you very much, Ivor, and thank you to the attendees. And welcome, everyone. And I'm Tenia Kiriazi, and I'm Deputy Director of Academic Operations at Middlesex University of Dubai. Uh, Middlesex University of Dubai is the first um, overseas campus of Middlesex University and it was uh, and it opened its doors in 2005 in Dubai and we are based in Knowledge Village. Um, so I agree with uh, I agree with you very much and you know what is an ideal uh, thriving collaborative environment that's of course you can never find an ideal one but uh, a thriving ecosystem of collaboration in higher education would consist of formal and informal uh, collaborations, connections and networks. And it would be across levels and across leaderships and across institutions. And there are different types of collaborations, right? So you have collaboration between the private sector and the university, you have collaborations within institutions, sometimes where even struggling to get collaborations within the same institution. Uh, we've got collaboration across disciplines. We've got collaboration between the government sector, the regulator and the university. So an ideal ecosystem would be one that you would have a little bit of all of that. Informal and formal, private sector, government sector, state universities, private universities, so uh, and, and academics between them. And I think that that is at the, at the heart of the issue. This is where we need to develop. Um, this, is where, this is where we need to work on. And um, I think Hugh will be uh, also happy to report on that. This panel has been born through one of these informal networks of, of collaboration that you, have, you Ivor, has uh, initiated through Altamimi and this partnership that we have. And I'm sure that Hugh would like to elaborate more on that. Thank, thank you very much, Tenia. And and Hugh, just going back to 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 that point, but but also maybe more broadly, you know, you you spoke about the need for collaboration, but maybe to put some flesh on 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 the bones in your you maybe from your UK experience, maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing what that looks like, and then perhaps talking about your experience in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Happy to. I mean, look, I, as some of you know, came from the private sector before, but I've now been in, in higher education for 25 years, and I've been very lucky. I've worked in the America, uh, but the majority of that time has been in the UK. And in the UK, um, the, the networks that exist, there are a number of them between CFOs, between CIOs, between university vice chancellors and presidents, and between COOs, chief operating officers like myself, are well established. For example, the 
the UK and the Isle and Ireland has the Association of Heads of University Administrators, which covers every university in the UK and Ireland. And it puts together almost 200 people like me in direct contact with each other, so that although our institutions may be collaborating in some areas and may be in competition in others, people who are running big, big businesses like we do are able to pick up the phone, send an email, and make that connection. Uh, and in fact, that was something I brought with me here when I came three years ago to the UAE. I was the first and, and only associate international member that remains at the heads of uh, university administrators back in the UK because that network is so vital. And again, I'll be honest with you, it's not something which we have here in the UAE. Uh, Tenia mentioned that the informal group we have, a, a, a like-minded group, if I might put it like that, convened as it happens by yourselves, Ivor, Al Tamimi, to bring together COOs and vice chancellors in the UAE to have the kind of discussions that I'm used to having and many others will be used to having in their own sectors from where they've come. I was really heartened this morning to hear His Excellency Hussein Al Hamadi, the Minister of Education here in the UAE, and also His Excellency Omar Khobash, who is the Assistant Minister for Culture and Public Diplomacy, talking very openly about the need for more of this kind of thing. Because it's great when we have people of their seniority in power recognizing that we need to emulate that model. You know, talking with each other, collaborating, happens already at academic level. That's one of the purposes of a university. So there's no reason why those professionals who are running universities shouldn't be doing the same thing and shouldn't be hiding or recoiling in, in suspicion of each other that we might be trying to share trade secrets or, or other things. You know, we're not in that commercial sphere. But what we do learn is that we, we share with each other potential solutions. And right now, during the COVID pandemic, this couldn't be more important when we are all having to deal with things in our institutions which we haven't perhaps had to deal with before or been prepared for. And we're able to, in our small group that Tenia mentioned, at least discuss and share and take some of the burden away. Uh, and I'd like to see that becoming a little bit wider and a little bit more formalized in the way that I was used to in the UK. Thank you, Hugh. And I think it's, it's important to emphasize our little group, we're not trying to, you know, change the world. We're we're focusing on practical issues, sharing best practices, for example, on, on how each campus dealt with COVID, data protection, uh, designing future campuses, very much uh, practical nuts and bolts issues for senior uh, people in the administrative side, rather than maybe airy-fairy, you know, policy doc, uh, discussions. I, th I think that's important to say as well. Um, Tanya, turning to you, I mean, this all seems like a complete no-brainer that institutions would be talking to each other, would be sharing um, best practice, but frankly, it doesn't seem to be happening to any great extent across the region. What do you think are the barriers to collaboration? And uh, you know, I'm conscious we probably touched on some of them uh, very briefly, but if you want to maybe give your perspective of why you think, why are we having this conversation? Why is this a topic that we're discussing today? Why is it not yeah, so what? Everyone's doing it. it. There's nothing to see here. Why are we discussing this? So I was reading a research paper um, recently. The, the research paper is not recent. It's from 2005, and it's from Adriana Keza from uh, the University of uh, Southern California. And she had identified three stages in, 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 a, in a thriving, collaborative uh, environment in higher education, as you put it. So the first stage was about building commitment within your institution. So you need to sell the narrative of collaboration. The leadership needs to sell the nar narrative of collaboration within the institution. And then the second step would be the commitment between institutions, across institutions, so externally from the institution and with other partners, partners to be institutions. And then the third stage would be sustaining, so building those networks, those infrastructure, if you want, that will sustain those collaborations. So I think that in the in the UAE and perhaps the GCC, I'm not aware of the rest of the of the MENA region. We are unfortunately at stage one now. I think that that the the academics are not sufficiently sold to the idea of collaboration or they need a little bit of a, of a push. It's, I'll tell you my experience, our experience at Mrs. University by a regulator, KHDA, has done a lot in that respect. And we have to admit that they have done a lot. So they have been putting in place initiatives to, to foster collaboration. For example, in their recent classification exercise where they classify and they rate the universities that they oversee, they have one indicator that is about collaborations. 
So universities are rated based on their work on collaboration, on promoting collaboration. And they also involve, um, you know, the heads of institutions, uh, they have feedback sessions, they have, uh, before that classification exercise, they gathered us all and asked for feedback and they communicated what they're trying to do. They also do that with students. So they often invite students to sit around the table and give their feedback across the institutions that they oversee. So I think at least from a PhD perspective, which is the one that I am familiar with, there is a will and, and from, from the regulator. So it is now up to the individual institution to sell that narrative within uh, their, their academic staff and their administration staff. And, and I agree with you now with COVID, it might sound paradox, but it is the truth. It is a tremendous opportunity for us to collaborate for two reasons. The first reason is that we are now all kind of restrained financially. All, all the universities it is admit that they could do better financially. So they are looking at ways to change their model and perhaps looking at collaboration. On the other hand, collaboration is easier than ever because with the use of technology now, we have minimized all, all barriers to the access to the participation and to the connection that is required in a collaboration. So we don't have to just look around us for collaboration. We can look at the world for collaboration. So it's a tremendous momentum here that all institutions in higher education need to tap in, I think. Thank you, Tania. And uh, totally echo your comments about KHDA. And and Hugh, turning to you, I mean, to be fair to the federal regulator, that you know the Ministry of Education also have been encouraging collaboration. But you know, some of the feedback you hear is that the institutions themselves haven't really acted in a shall we say mature manner uh, and are are you know waiting to be spoon fed maybe than rather than being proactive. Any any views on that? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more, actually. I mean, you know, the, ten years mentioned the KHDA here in Dubai. You just mentioned the ministry, the federal ministry, based in Abu Dhabi, Ivor. And, you know, one of the things, uh, again, I'm going to be very frank here, you know, one of the things that's refreshing about this summit, these three days that we're on now, and I, I'm going to give kudos to our to our host, NYU Abu Dhabi, because this, this summit's theme is liberal arts, or what we would call arts and humanities in the UK. And some of the things that have come out from this morning and, and yesterday's sessions have been around... Um, the interdisciplinarity and the collegiality of the liberal arts. Something I, you know, is very special to me because I come from a, an English literature and poetry background. That's what I started as an academic. And so that what saddens me is when I come into a world which is, and I'll say this openly, dominated by STEM, top down by industry, and how much money students will make with their STEM degree. That then leads certain institutions of the kind you mentioned, Ivor, to be suspicious of each other, to be in competition with each other, and to be not collegiate when it comes to collaborating, both at academic and at administrative level. And the irony behind all of this is we just had a session um, before ours, in fact, today, where some really eminent speakers from, from across this region and beyond talked about the importance of student mobility. And we, I listened to one of the NYU Rhodes Scholars who studied at Oxford, my own institution, and I was just, it was so great to hear him speak. And an Emirati who's learned so much from his time in America, in the UK and elsewhere, as a student. And if students need to do that, then we need to learn as institutions and those of us that run institutions that we should be just as open. You know, I, I eschew this idea of, of being suspicious of each other. And I do blame a lot of that on this industry push towards STEM. Because if you are obsessed with how much you will earn as a graduate, then the universities that are uh, teaching you and from which you graduate will also become obsessed on how much they can earn. And if the pot is only this big and others can't have a part of that, then you're going to start working in competition with each other in the way that industry does. And look, I have nothing against industry. As I said, I came from industry. So my eyes are open to marketing and the real world. But I, you know, I came into university because it's a different world. It's not about, as I've said many times before, we're not about jobs for future students. We're about training graduates for life and giving them life skills. And as institutions, if we're closed off and suspicious and competitive of each other and not open to this... Um, collaborative uh, approach that we're discussing, this thriving ecosystem that, that Tanya mentioned, then we're not giving an example to our own students and that we can't blame them when they then leave and just look for the highest paid job immediately, even if it isn't something they're passionate about and if it isn't something that they're actually very good at. 
Excellent, Hugh. Thank you for that. And just to take up that point with Tenia, perhaps, you know, even even if you were a STEM orientated higher education provider, that you know, generally speaking, requires a lot of R and D, heavy heavy expenses. The institutions around here, you know, we we don't have the type of endowments that we see in the top Russell Group universities or the US. Sure, surely the argument is even even within the STEM environment that we should be collaborating with our competitors in relation to R and D. I mean, it's very very common to do in other jurisdictions to pony up with the other the next leading university. Your 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 most your you know your biggest rival. It's quite it's quite common to pony up with them and get involved in R and D projects and 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 do you know obtain joint funding. Um, so even you know even taking huge argument, I would have thought. There, 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 there's a persuasive case to have collaboration in, in R&D, also on shared services, shared campuses. You know, we have some incredibly fantastic campuses in the UAE, but it cost an absolute fortune to build. Is there an argument for, you know, getting together and, and, and sharing the sports facilities, other lab, lab facilities? I'd be interested in your views on, on, on that, Tenny. I mean, the, the, there's so many types of collaboration that we can have. I agree with you. I mean, we, we can have uh, we can have community engagement. So together, all the universities together, or some universities together, they can collaborate with the community engagement for promoting sustainable development goals from from small activities, even you know, to clean uh, the desert or to clean the beach or to do a plastic-free campaign together. So there's. So many things that that unite us, and 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 I agree with you um, on the point that collaboration is now the only option. It seems to be a one-way uh, street, really, because I was also reading a, a report from Ernst Young from last year, 2020, and it was reporting a pretty gloomy uh, picture of the higher education, saying that basically we have many more institutions than the market can sustain. So the institutions now, they have two options. Either they, they upgrade their value proposition or they have to cut costs. And cutting costs is not really, it's not really a sustainable solution going forward in terms of you know, offering excellence and quality in education. So collaboration will help the institutions upgrade this value proposition that, that they are offering, they're putting to the table. And, and beyond that, and I was also attending this, uh, this panel earlier with, with the, the student or the Emirati uh, man who, who was reflecting on his, on his um, experience as a student going around the world. This, this, these are the programs that students value, that expose them to the world, that you know, open their horizons. And uh, I myself, that made me re remember of myself when I was in Greece and I took the Erasmus program and I spent a year in France and that really opened my horizon. So Erasmus programs, for, for those who are familiar with the European Union programs, this is an example of collaboration between state universities that benefits students enormously. And so students are super keen to go to, to programs that are a result of collaboration between institutions across different countries, across different continents. And that's why you see uh, the success of those degrees that are offered in different seats, as, as you can say, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Abu Dhabi, in, in, in many different seats. So joint degrees, uh, joint research projects, joint community engagement initiatives, and so on. Thank you, Tania. Just we've got some great questions coming in, so if 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 if, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to put some of them to you. Um, very interesting one here, Hugh. If I, if I can ask you, um, "Monkey see, monkey do" is a proverb that may be appropriate. If students see a competitive and suspicious mindset at university level, is there a danger that this becomes an attitude value they bring with them into their life? Well, I might have I might have written that question myself. I <laughs> honestly say my hands were, were not typing. Yeah, I totally agree. It's kind of the point I was as alluded to earlier. Um, look, one of the things around this issue of our theme is higher education collaboration in the Middle East. The, the students will obviously look at the, the, the options they have in front of them. And, you know, the UAE has this very laudable um, ambition to become a leader in higher education in the next 50 years. And to do that, we need to have what we would call a, short, a, a full shot front of, for want of a better word, degree products on offer. 
Students will look at our market at the moment, and we have some real strengths, sure, and they're mostly in STEM and engineering, as you might expect. So we, in order to build the liberal arts, arts and humanities um, shop front, the, this summit is about on which many of us, including the minister himself, talk, uh, have been trying to talk up. We must have collaboration. Students have got to see universities offering a diversity and not just two degrees. All of us are in competition because that competitiveness is not healthy and it will be then reflected in the students that we graduate. And I, you know, I banged on this point several times before. I was lucky enough to, to, to give a TED talk earlier this year in which I made the point that if we keep producing STEM graduates with this quite narrow focus, not only will they run out of skills quite quickly because the skill world is changing and their careers will change so quickly, but also where are our musicians? Where are our poets? Where are the actors we want to see on the stage or the writers of the books that we enjoy? If we're not doing that, and in this culture, particularly in the Middle East, which has a fantastic history in the arts, in, in writing, in calligraphy, in painting, and in religion, if we're not studying these comparatively, and we're only focusing on those STEM subjects, and we're pushing students into them like a funnel, then of course students are going to come out monkey see, monkey do. And they're going to replicate that in the future. And, and that's what really worries me as an educator. I had the benefit of, a, of an arts and humanities degree myself, or two of them, uh, and I don't want to see those becoming the, the second-class citizens and the, and the options which are no longer available or, or not even offered. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, Tanya, great question for you. Do you feel that the Times Higher Education Arabic University rating will help or hinder collaboration in the, in the MENA region? It's a, it's a great question. I think it will. All classification, rankings, and, and all of these exercises, I mean, you need to look at them with pinch of salt. This, the, you know, there are a lot of factors that sometimes are not all factored in. So sometimes they do not always reflect the quality of, of each institution or the quality of offering of each institution, or they would, you know, ignore one factor that is, is somewhat important in the student experience. But I think that overall, we should welcome them and we should think they, they, they would bring collaboration because as I said, we cannot keep competing with each other. It is not going to get us anywhere. The only, the only way to, to upgrade our value proposition is to collaborate. It will come to a point that everyone will realize that. And I think that the whole COVID situation has accelerated uh, that journey towards that end point where there is no other way than to realize you've got to collaborate. You've got to, to offer something new, something fresh. Yeah, thank you. And, and because you uh, talked about STEM earlier, you can combine STEM with liberal arts, and it's a wonderful combination because also STEM and AI and robotics and engineering, it is the future, but it's also what you put inside those, those machines, and that will come from liberal arts graduates, right? So collaboration of those would be fantastic, and... That's another sort of collaboration that I was speaking about. So if there are different types, and I think yeah. we need to explore it with an open mind and cut all the you know kind of barriers that because you were saying earlier what are the barriers? One of the barriers, for example, visa issues. You cannot have a change of students easily because the visa issues, the, the visa regime is quite strict. It is opening up now though in the UAE at least that I'm familiar with, and that shows that we are opening up towards this sort of collaborations. Thank you, Tania. Um, I'm conscious we're into, I can't believe we're into our last few minutes already, but um, we had a question which I, uh, I'll, I'll attempt to answer myself. Uh, what stops uh, MENA institutes from having formal networks like the U15 group of Canadian research universities, for example, or informal networks um, of, say, policy uh, officers, academic HR. I, I, well, uh, first of all, on the informal, uh, that's the group that Hugh and Hugh and Tenny and I are part of. That's an informal network. There's nothing to stop that. I think on the formal level, there has been some reticence by institutions that they don't want to be seen to be joining a group formally that um, may be seen to be lobbying or or or. Um, challenging the Ministry of Education, which of course they're not, but there is that, I think, perception and reticence about joining uh, formal groups. Uh, and, and, and I don't know, does, does Hugh or Tenia have anything to add on, on, on that? 
Uh, yeah, just really quickly, Andrew, I think that that reticence you mentioned earlier actually comes from beneath, as it were, in the institutions. And, and the more I learn about the ministry here, and you're not just today, but from others, uh, and listening to the minister himself, I realize that, you know, a lot of that's unfounded. There is a necessary, um, you know, competitiveness amongst the private institutions here. But there's no regulatory reason why we shouldn't collaborate more. In fact, the minister asked for more collaboration and creativity in that when he opened this summit yesterday. So I think it's partly institutional naivety and this lack of, uh, you know, I, I want to be aware of word, this lack of collegiality, which baffles a lot of us that come from outside. And we'll have these conferences and we'll talk openly about being friends with each other. But when it comes down to it, the doors close. And that's not a great message to be giving, not just to our students, but also our communities and industry and others that we want to work with. Because Tenny has mentioned it, without collaboration, we're nothing. And, and she's bang on, by the way, about STEM and the liberal arts working together. You know, that's the whole point. When we go into silos, we don't achieve anything. AI will not work without the liberal arts thinking of the ethics of AI. An engineer can make the robot, but somebody else who understands philosophy needs to understand the ethics and either from your perspective, the legalities. Of it. Thanks, you. Coming to, you know, the final one or two points. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask, Tanya, maybe I'll, I'll ask you, um, in relation to the higher education's role within the wider society. So, I mean, you did mention collaboration is, it's a few different directions, isn't it? It's between university, it's between the university and the regulator. And then it's also between the universities and the wider society. That could include industry, normally does. Also includes other uh, facets of society. And you've touched on it. You mentioned some CSR initiatives that, that universities could be getting involved in, et cetera. Any, any comments on that? The university's role in wider society, um, and, and, and what they could be doing, collaborating on that level? Well, there, is, there is very big role that the universities can play, the higher education institutions can play, and it depends on them. But it, it is, it is a, a, it's such a large and fertile ground that they are operating on. So you, you can look at you know, the sustainable development goals, for example, and you look at the environmental activities that they can do that I, I, I mentioned earlier, or the well-being, promoting well-being, so having, you know, well-being initiatives for sports and mental health initiatives that they can be hosted at the universities to, to educate the community, so beyond our student body, just, you were saying earlier, what, what, what is missing? What is missing is people that see the big picture, is a big picture there that we need to see. It's not just our university, how many students are we recruiting, how many do they graduate? What are the pro that, that's that's great. We need to be looking at that, but we also need to have a vision about what is the role of higher education that, that we want to play, and higher education wants to play in a community, because historically this is what will matter. It won't matter if you have three thousand students or two thousand five hundred, or it, what's the progression rate. Right? It will matter if if you leave your stamp. If, if, if you create a wave of, of a better society, and I know it sounds a little bit naive and, you know, utopian, but it, it has to start from somewhere. And I think that the universities are the perfect place to start. So bring in the community, educate the parents about, you know, mental health issues, about well-being issues, about how to promote a healthy lifestyle and healthy, healthy eating, sports, um, literature, music, you know, all of these things. They, they, they are part of life, the community engagement. And, and of course, the universities here, they, they are likely to be, I think, to, to be collaborating with the industry a lot. So, you know, employers come in and that's, that would be, and companies come in and that would be part of the CSR initiatives. We've got the UN Global Compact, the UAE chapter, and it has a wonderful network. So we can use that network. Lots of universities are in that network too. Thanks, Tanya. Hugh, um, I suppose same same question for you. I know it's a subject close to your heart as well. Lifelong learning, the the role of university within the wider community, um, and moving perhaps away from uh, a transactional approach to a more transformative one. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments. Yeah, no, I, I I echo what Tanya was saying. I mean, look, we need to be honest here. I mean, in in the UAE particularly, and in this region in the GCC, and men are wider. Um, Universities are new in many cases. You know, I, I, I'm at a university which is relatively old in our standards. You know, 2003 we were set up, but even that is not old, really. Um, 
we're up against universities. You know, NYU, our host, a great example. Marriott Vesterman and her colleagues have large endowments to work with. The universities that I've worked with, you know, go back a thousand years in the UK. That gives you a lot of time to build your uh, presence in your community. You know, university is a beating heart of its community. So it's understandable that in a, a new world like here, universities very, very young are going to go straight to industry because those are the connections they want to get for their students and for their graduates. But the reality is that theatres, music, once you're outside any of the big cities of the world, universities are always the biggest resource in their region. If you want to do lifelong learning that Tanya mentioned, if you want to learn about health, if you want to do sport, if you want to use a swimming pool in some cases, if you want to go to the theatre or listen to music, you'll go to your local university because they have the resources and the campus for you to visit. And NYU, you know, again, kudos to them, they do that very well here in Abu Dhabi, but it's not the norm. And, I, you know, I don't expect it to happen overnight, but I would love to see more of that, um, more sharing of spaces, more sharing of spaces with each other and with the public to say to the people who, in whose communities we live, this is part of your lives, too. It's not just for students. Students are th people get this obsession that students are just 18. You know, I lectured for many years um, as a professor at the Open University. Where many of my students were twice my age. They were people in prison. They were people who'd never been in education. They were single mums. They were retired people. They were people who were using a university for all kinds of purposes. And, and that's what we do, what we do for. And um, one of the reasons why I want to try and widen that conversation beyond STEM, you know, I'm nothing against STEM, but if we just put all our eggs in that industry basket, we don't have the universities in the communities to visit. We don't have the spaces of the sport to see. We're not, you know, America does this extremely well. If you want to go and see a football game, you go to your local university. College sports are massive. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And, and I would love to see that developing in this region too, because it's, after all, what our students deserve. Thank you so much, Hugh. Thank you, Tania. I think that's a really positive note to finish this uh, conversation. Um, I think if I can sum it up in one line, I think, uh, Collaboration, it sounds a little bit airy-fairy, but that's not what we're talking about. It's a need to have, not a, not, a, not a nice to have, in order for the Middle East to move forward in the rankings and, 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 and to en enrich the lives of their students and the community. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks for the questions, some, some, some good ones there. And uh, it's, 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 it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.